Good enough. <laughs> you, need, you need to count you down to the No, intro. no, I think uh, that, that's about as good as we're going to get, you know, and just kind of ease right into it. And speaking of, you know, as good as it gets, I guess this was, this type of movie is um, as cult as it gets. Like, this is this is a cult fucking movie. I think that's why this was so popular and picked by our, our audience. I, I really, <laughs> it's... I really don't know, understand why uh, this was the most popular one, but other than that, I mean, it's just some fun kills and, and a cult classic here. I, I don't know what I would compare this to, like, as far as uh, as ridiculousness or any other film that this would be. Uh, what is, else has McGee done that we compare? Terminator, I guess. So it's a wacky version of that. I, I just don't, as far as, like, slasher horror comedy goes i i don't know what i would get this one there's a sequel here yeah i mean i'm not i'm not too sure where this came from because you know mcg normally does the frenetic action nonsense his movies tend to be kind of plotless um like charlie's angels they have their MacGuffin that moves the story along but it's not really about that and same thing with terminator uh man salvation which I'm really I'm super surprised that they gave him a Terminator movie based off of the Charlie's Angels movies because there's nothing in there that I thought you know what dourness that's what he does well you know I'm I'm looking at his McGee's that is at, at his filmography and I'm just looking at like this is all over the place and that's really how I again put this movie this movie was all over the place as is like a Charlie's Angels that movie was just as ridiculous that's actually a good way to this was this was a horror version of charlie's angels like the way things happened and how it got there is just like you're just along with it it's like yeah sure like uh, a lot of, there's a lot of fun kills and that's just what it was but it just what i call the rugrat effect where things just kind of happen in such a sequence over and over and over and over that it just happens perfectly that you know it ends up killing Five people, I guess. Yeah. Freak, freak do, you, do, do you do you think that McG is a good director? Now, I'm not saying like, um, does he make good movies? But do you do you think he's a? Do you feel like he's a good director? I, yeah, because I still enjoyed it. Like it was pretty to watch. Like I, it was still a. It was fun. It was the perfect amount of time that it needed to be for a movie like this. It didn't take itself too seriously. It had fun. You can tell that everybody uh, that was in it was having fun. It was uh, a close set, so it didn't have to go too out of the realm of crazy. So I, I yeah, I actually give him credit. Like, and he, there was a the camera work was all over the place too. It switched a lot of different angles. We had a first person, we had a third person, we had a, a, a second person, I think too, maybe. I, don't, I mean. It was all over. We had a Hitchcock effect where it was just on the scenery at one point. I, I, it was, it was, it was a lot. There was, it was a lot going on. Yeah, no, that's like his thing. Like his style is just hyper style. There's no real, like it's all kitsch, you know. Like there's no con- the consistent through line uh, from the movies I've seen from him, like um, the two Charlie's Angels, this movie, and Terminator Salvation. Uh, Terminator Salvation is obviously his most uh, toned down, I guess, because that doesn't really seem like a McG movie when you look at it compared to the other three movies. But I like I would say that his style is just hyper stylized. Everything does not like the the camera shots don't necessarily fit the visual information or the tempo that we're we're experiencing Um, because. Like the the action from Charlie's Angels is that hyperkinetic wire foo matrix style stuff, and then like this when you get you get some stuff where he's like over anxious, um, the character Cole in this in, in the babysitter when he's over anxious or he's ex, you know experiencing the traumatic stuff near the beginning of the movie when but that kind of dissipates and goes away the further we get into the teenagers trying to kill him, um, and I think. I mean, for me, I don't think McGee's a very good director because um, this kind of th- this movie this movie feels like a mishmash 
um, where there's no real signature style coming. I don't feel like his voice, he's the author of this movie. It is kind of, kind of, I don't, I don't want to say going through the paces, but that, that's kind of how it feels. Because look, looking at, um, considering the sets, like the set design and decoration and the tone of the movie, it feels like sort of like a super, I don't want to say mature, but like a more adult version of like the Adams family okay. movie from the early nineties or even like, um, Edward Scissorhands, like that style that I don't want to say Gothic horror, was but that's, you know, the, the Tim Burton. It has so the feel of a group project and everyone got a piece. Yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> I, I do wonder, um, I suspect that maybe a lot of people asked us to do this movie because it also stars uh, Samara Weaving. And we did uh, praise her performance in Ready or Not earlier uh, in the year 2019, yeah. which um, I think she was the saving grace in it. Ha! <laughs> because her character was yeah. Grace. I think, it's... <laughs> I think that's a good one. I think she's the best part of this movie, too. I think... Um fucking what's her name b yeah. i think she she's she's really good as b like the like at the start of the movie when you're when they're trying to get you into cole's life and his world and stuff and how he's this this outcast or like he gets bullied very easily by his his classmates and all this stuff but he's got this super cool friend named b that even though he's you know he doesn't he doesn't need a babysitter because he's you know he's 12 he's maturing you know, he's still. It's still cool to have her around because it's this 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 hot older girl. I don't, I don't know if they ever give B a specific age. I'm assuming senior or something like that. I, I mean, um, I, yeah. The the reason why anyone would question it is is like the, your answer is right there. That's that's why she's still babysitting me. You know, and yeah, I, I'll keep on going. Like I, I'm 35. I still need a babysitter. <laughs> Like, it, you know, she just seems like the ultimate cool girl, like the cool chick, that older girl that you always are like looking up to and looking at oh, as yeah. like, you hold her on this pedestal. Um, and then when the switch comes and she's trying to kill Cole in the second part of the movie, well, I guess the second act and the third act, um, it doesn't it doesn't feel weird or different because, you know, I, it's not like a brilliant performance or anything, but she does I think Smart Weaving does exactly what she needs to do to get the point across. Yeah, exactly. And you have other uh, it people, I guess, uh, starting in this as well too. You have um, the, of, of the characters, Bella Thorne. Uh, and I know that Andrew Bachelor has been uh, a presence in uh, in a lot of whatever TikToks and in whatnots and um, things like that. So okay. So do you do you want to go through the plot, or do we do we want to just jump around? Um, I don't know if much of it. I'm trying to. Oh, I'm going through the synapses real quick. Okay. But, uh, yeah, basically, it j- just that, right? A uh, 12-year-old Cole Johnson uh, has the ultra cool babysitter. Uh, one night he stays up. Oh man! So she was gonna drug him, right? That's how she would do it. Yeah. And uh, instead, he he dodges that bullet. Uh, sees her do some fucking ritual. We see some nerd get it. Uh, in a very gruesome death that didn't make a whole lot of sense. But, uh... No, I... So watching watching this with my wife, well, I think amplified the experience for me. because Especially that spin the bottle scene before they kill Sacrifice... So sacrifice Sam is what they, yeah. they ended up calling him. Um, because you have... So the hot jock dares B to kiss everyone in the room. And she kisses him, the the jock first aggressively, and then she has this like super erotic makeout session with the hot cheerleader played by Belle Thorne. And then you know she licks the what's Max? No, Max is the jock. Oh, um, I can't. He is John. John. She licks John's face, and then she does like a forehead kiss with Chloe. Is it Chloe? Uh. The girl from Pitch oh, Perfect. Oh yes, yes. Uh, no, it's a. Uh, okay. Chloe's neighbor. Who it is? I thought Melanie was the neighbor. 
Uh, Melanie is the neighbor, yes. Oh, Sonia? Sonia. Okay. So she does forehead kiss with Sonia, and then she, you know, pa- like, passionately, I guess, not passionately, she kisses Sam, right? But how it's shot and how it's presented is very weird. Like, each kiss is shot differently. There's a contrast in sort of the lighting and, and how how it's shot, like the angles and, and whatnot. And then once you get to Sam, it's it's presented as this, you know, the final moment in a teen coming of age movie where the, the, the nerd main character finally gets to kiss the girl of his dreams, you know, and like the music swells and it's just, it's shot yeah, where, rotating camera. you know, it's, it's yeah. And Cole's upstairs seeing all this. And then my wife was really into it. Like she was, sold on the movie up to this point now granted this is like 20 minutes into the movie and then all of a sudden she she her, she raises her hands comes crashing down with two long knives right into his head and my wife's like fuck this this is fucking stupid this is the stupidest movie i've ever seen yeah yep oh okay but i, I think yeah, like I wonder how many people have that reaction, how many people turned off the TV after that, or how many people just went with the flow. It's like, yeah, it's what it is. That's life. I, I actually did a big smile. I was like, okay, all right, let's go. It was it was so dumb, and I was just like, yes, all right, let's. You know what? Let's go. If if it's like this, I don't mind that. I don't mind watching like an Evil Dead or like a Poultry Geist, uh, those those types <laughs> of movies. And uh, and that's basically what this was. It just got ever more the ridiculous as the movie progresses it's it was <laughs> but it was like again it was it was fun when you have a movie that's just like you know what don't even worry about it we don't we're not here to ask questions just buckle up you're gonna watch it and that's that's what happens i'm all i'm all for it again as long as it doesn't take two hours of my life then i i, I think you've got something yeah. going on here because after that like um what happens next? Oh, oh, uh, so they, they start to drink the blood, right? They start to, this guy is just flowing blood from the wounds, and they're grabbing it from these goblets, and they're, <laughs> the gag where the one uh, the blood gets sprayed on John, and uh, it's all because we find out that uh, because she has, like, an Necronomicon book of sort, and they need the blood to make a wish, right? Yeah, well, the, yeah, they they pour, they spill the blood, they drip the blood on the page as they're reading the incantations, and any wish they they wish for is granted. Right. So they need the uh, the blood of the was it was that guy the ver- the blood who was that guy? He was the sacrifice. They needed a blood from they needed the blood from a sacrifice, blood from the innocent. Oh, that's right, that's right. And so the drugging of coal was so they can go upstairs and snatch some of that blood. Mm-hmm. But unbeknownst to them, so how do you feel? Right, Cole is up the entire time, <laughs> and like it's it, it does kind of feel like a uh, this is a dark reimagining of Home Alone. Like Home Alone itself is already dark, but this is kind of like a self aware what ha- what ensues is kind of like a self aware Home Alone because he's setting traps, he's hurting people, um, some stuff that comes back from the beginning like the car, the knife, things like that. This this feels like how do you, how do you you've read a lot of Goosebumps books. I, end a statement. <laughs> end a statement. Do you have a, a particular one or just in general? Um, which ones were like that? Uh, the maybe Haunted Mask, maybe uh, uh, How to Kill a Monster, kind of like these. Uh, just <laughs> just how 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 it's the kid this 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 tweeny kid is able to just kind of go from one from one room to the other and conquer every foe that comes at him. It's just okay. How how do you feel about the individual deaths? Cuz that's really what makes or breaks a movie like this. How the deaths are portrayed or how you just how you reacted to it. How how did, what did you think was the best one? <laughs> um which one was the best death? Oh, ooh. Um maybe Maybe Sonya, I guess, just just getting blown up with the firework and in the in the crawl space. That seemed like a pretty cool one. Okay. But I, I but again the the Jock Max, right? Is that uh, his was was yeah was the quarterback quite ridiculous too. And that one was like almost I feel why does McGee 
always he likes putting hanging ropes in his movies, like uh, all a lot of them. Count them. There's there's a lot of rope in his, in his movies, and they likes to do stunts with them. But um, here we are with the death. As uh, Max, was he, he had egg on his hands and slipped and through a series of unfortunate events was uh, hung. Not to mention, I think, at least six cuts between the fall and the, the end. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, he was a nice guy. You know, he just, he just wanted to... Yeah, he tried to, he tried to help. He tried to help Cole uh, stand his ground and, and grow a pair to stand up to the bully um, right before he tried to kill Cole. That, which is also, like, Max's death, the hanging of the rope, that is actually my favorite kill in the movie just because the end result, um, how you see his spine <laughs> sticking out yeah. of his neck, uh, extra touch, very nice, over the top, kind of what I was expecting uh, after the, the, the initial death in the movie. Um how did, how did you feel the surprise um, with Bella Thorne's character, the cheerleader? Uh, I thought it was funny, actually, from the start when the cops came in and they had killed the cops and she got sh- shot in the boob and got blasted like 15 fucking feet back uh, into the wall. That was hilarious. So first death I get was, was fun. But then she came back and um, has like, this is funny too because all these characters are, are kind of like, they're not you know, they're not really like psycho. They're just kind of in over their heads type of thing. So they have, they're nice, you know, like Max is nice. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Allison. Yeah. She had, you know, she had relatable moments. Like she tried to, yeah, there was a, a human moment there, but, uh, say with B too, they're all nice people, but you know, they're just getting involved with the dark side uh, from time to time, I guess. And that's what happens to you. Uh, but with her revenge is pretty funny as she tries to. Uh, um, the knife callback was actually pretty was pretty fun. Um, I enjoyed I, I enjoyed yeah. that. That was that was cute because I knew that Chekhov's knife, uh, as it was shown in in the the act one. I thought that was again real cute. Um, and then she gets blown away. That's that's about it, right? I mean, guns in these movies are um, rare. Because they're always the last resort. They're the easiest kill. Isn't that what happens to her? She gets, she gets. Yeah, she gets her head blown off from a great distance away. She gets scanners. <laughs> um. The uh, oh man, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say something going off of what you said. Um, but now I can't remember. Oh, the archetype. Okay, so each of the characters in this group, you have Max the Jock. You have um. John, who's the cool guy, the, the, um, the, like, the cool friend, the stoner, the, the cheerleader, guy. like the slutty cheerleader. You got the goth Asian girl. Well, I guess the goth girl. She just happens to be Asian. And then you have B. What would B be? What would B end up being in I, this I sort of the, slasher the, horror the archetype? Standard, the virginal? The, I don't know. The mean girl? The it girl? Maybe the, the just, just the main, not the cheerleader, but she's like, I don't know, just the, the posh fashion. I don't know. This is a regular kind of a breakfast club. You know, yeah, but like you have the in in your like '80s '90s slashers like Scream, and uh, I know what you did last summer. You have those those certain characters would be she wouldn't. I guess she is babysitter because she I wouldn't necessarily classify her as like the the like the shy virgin because she's not at all. So I don't know exactly what uh, she would be. Wish. She's the Wiccan, uh, you know, obviously. Uh, you know, Sands the craft, you know, kind of uh, in a new age. In a McG version. Okay. <laughs> All right. But like, how do how do you how do you feel um, flipping? Because this movie is all about like it's it knows what it is. It's self aware. There's references to like forced references to movies uh, throughout the movie. Um, do you feel like flipping the archetype on its head, where you have this group of people that will progressively get killed by a serial killer throughout the movie? They are, in fact, the bad guys. They are the ones doing the killing, and it's the one person trying to escape them that ends up ac- accidentally killing them for the most part. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's kind of a fun little, like a, like a Dale versus Tucker versus Evil. That's actually a good way to, to yeah. compare that too. Where again, it's just one of these, uh, uh, because it, it provides a sense of innocence for the character. 
in a lot of a sense of uh, comedy. You don't feel guilty about anyone who dies just because it's it's just so ridiculous enough already, and then it's an accident. So it's just like, oh well, you know, there's there's no spite or vengeance or anything like, like that. Although you might be rooting for him. Uh, obviously, there's Max is trying to kill Cole at uh, like actually has him in his hands at the moment. So you know that that one you might be rooting against him, but. No, for the for the most part, again, that's that's the comedy of it is just because um, of how imaginative these kills can get, and I I hope we get just as many in uh, 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 Babysitter too. It, the same worked for um, uh, what was it uh, Happy Death Day or yeah, that that series is like it's just a reason just to show <laughs> just just nutty kills. And have fun, have fun with it. It's a date movie. Are they making a sequel to The Babysitter? So apparently it's going to come out this year, 2020, which I'm sure we're going to see. Oh wow! Soon. I read, I read that, I read that this movie shot in 2005, and it wasn't released until Netflix purchased it in air to for their streaming service. Um, so I mean that would be six years or five years between. When it was actually filmed and in the new one. I mean, good. You know, you got some time to let the creativity kind of stew a little bit, right? Get uh, get real good for for number two. That's what that's what you gotta do. You know, get a. Uh... Are they bringing back McG and Samara Weaving? Uh, let's uh, let's take a look. Well, I wonder if. It's like I know. Yeah. I know B dies at the end of the first movie, but she's you know a witch, so. Or she has a pact with the devil, so it's very easy, very easy to write her back into the story. Uh, it, it as far as this is concerned, it looks like we have a looks like we have a returning everything. Oh wow! I wonder how they managed that. So all right then, again, if this is how it's gonna be. Then I'm I'm down. Let's uh, <laughs> let's see. Is this, is this what happens when you just kind of let the kids drive for a bit? Yeah, I guess so. Someone was just like, Michi, I do just w- go ahead, Michi. Just go ahead and do something. He's like, yeah, I got it. I wonder how the second... I wonder how... Let, let's let's hypothesize what might happen in this one, in, in The Babysitter 2, uh, The Reckoning. Because at this point, Cole, if, if they're going to do three, three years later or five years later, if Cole is the same kid, he's going to be near graduating high school like that age range yeah so he definitely wouldn't need a babysitter anymore so what do you Hmm. eric of movie guys podcast think is going to happen in the sequel to the babysitter uh if all of these characters are coming back and all these characters are dead then i wonder if judah Lewis, oh, that's his character, or is it the actor's name, uh, Cole, if he finds some way to uh, maybe go on to the other side and see all of them, maybe? Or maybe they'll have to do some sort of uh, summoning spell. That I, I mean, it, we're, we're talking dark magic here, so the uh, possibilities are almost limitless when it, comes to, when it comes to that. You know, there's a portal to travel somewhere, so that's what I think is going to happen. They're going to kind of tune in with the dark magic a bit and make that an excuse. Either summon everyone back from the dead or uh, maybe do like another uh, the other side type of thing. But I really hope they they, they stay out of the whole time travel uh, possibility. I feel like that's been done. Uh, as, again, twice already with Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to you. And uh, I feel like that would just be kind of riding on their coattails. And that's not really a cool thing. So avoid avoid the time travel. Stick to the dark magic here, McGee, and I I think that's what's gonna happen. Do do you have do you have right, a fair uh, enough. another guess? I mean, I think I think what's gonna happen is B spirit is some way gonna manifest itself into Melanie, who by the end of the of the first movie is Cole's girlfriend, the girl down the street. And is going to somehow resurrect um, her her friends, the people that were part of the party, and 
um, Cole's going to have to struggle with the fact that he loves Melanie, but also needs to kill her. And that's where your humor is going to going to come out of. Oh, well, there you go. That's actually not a bad either. Uh, bad, I guess, have the old uh, trilogy of terror kind of uh, thing. The old, uh, oh, what's that movie? Um, with Dustin, or with Denzel Washington, with a fallen, with a killer's fallen passed through. Is a, yeah, hopping from yeah. person to person. Nuts. Yeah. All right, so I guess to wrap it up, uh, Eric, what's your what's your uh, popcorn Listen, rating for I this film? I was going into this thinking it was just going to be, I I, I don't know, something kind of silly, bad acting, and you know, just some some crap. I, I was actually entertained with this because uh, again, I appreciate a movie that is just there to have fun and knows what it is. I I think this movie kind of checked the boxes of what it wanted to be. And it it really worked. Um, Tamara Weaving acts the shit out of this movie. Like it, it's almost like she Jim carried it at, at some points. You know, just kind of overacting in in some parts. But again, it worked. I think everyone had chemistry. Um, I'm excited to see the sequel. Um, I would uh, actually give this a large bag. Thank thank you, movie guys fans, for recommending this one. I was pleasantly surprised. It, it's just silly. Is it a great movie? Hell no. But I had fun with it. That's that's my take. All right, cool beans. I I've seen this movie before. Uh, last year, I was my roommate um, had us watch it, and I thought maybe I didn't I didn't much enjoy it the first time. So I thought maybe kind of knowing what I'm getting myself into this time around, it might be a little better. Um, I did not enjoy it again a second run through. Uh, I'm there are enjoyable moments like you know some of the deaths are creative, um, some of the humor is is okay, but a lot of things feel forced. Uh, the tone changes um, drastically and it, it doesn't necessarily work. I know like we had uh, our last review for Parasite and I praised the shit out of the twist in the movie and how the tone changes. Um, this thing, this movie does the exact same thing, but it just doesn't work. Um, and as it progresses to get over more over the top and more kitschy and campy, I don't know. I just couldn't buy into it. Um, but Samara Weaving is great in this movie. She was great in Ready or Not, and I like. I'm I'm a fan of hers now. At this point, I, I'm looking forward to like all the stuff she she does. Because B in the first part of this movie is someone like as a kid, I could very. I mean, even now as a 30 year old adult, I could very easily fall in love with um, like her personality and just like what Samara Weaving brings to the character. Um, But like Mick G doesn't add anything to this. Um, The writing is kind of subpar. It feels like a, to me, like an imitation of movies that I watched when I was a kid and enjoyed. Like I, like I said earlier, um, Edward Scissorhands, Adam's family movie. Um, But yeah, um, so I'm gonna give it a small bag. Um, but you know, I, I would recommend it cause it is an over the top gory movie. And I know a lot of people enjoy that. And I'm assuming that is one of the main reasons why it was requested by the listeners that's, that we have. Yeah. I, I imagine. So that's really why I, I liked it again. It was just, it just got to a point where it was just so ridiculous that I, again, you just kind of throw everything else away. And, and um, if, uh, if for this sequel, Ryan, how about this? If, if it, if you were to turn the dial uh, on up or down on the uh, ridiculous meter, uh, <laughs> what would be better for you if you had to, if you had to choose? I think that I would I would probably crank it up, but I the the writing needs to match it though. Like if a character, if I can believe in the character, then it being over the top doesn't bother me in the slightest. One of my favorite movies is Brain Dead. Dead Alive, whatever you want to call it, by Peter Jackson from the early 90s. So fucking over the top, so gory. But I buy into it because not only is it fun, but the main character is actually somewhat relatable as this nebbish loser. Yeah. Um, not saying that I'm a nebbish loser, but it, his, the way he's presented, he's he's relatable. And that's it hooks you in and gets you in. I didn't really feel that with Cole. Okay. I, I, I could take that. I think that was left for the ensemble cast. Because I really think that everyone else here, I don't know if it's just a an age thing, if it's just a child actor, but uh, I really feel like everyone else uh, as a part of the crew uh, really, really did a bang-up job. 
of just of just kind of uh, of having fun with it. Uh, that was the believable part for me. So yeah, it definitely was not coal as a shining light. It was definitely uh, every everything else, you know. And that's what I hope to kind of see in in the right. movies. I, I would definitely crank it up a bit more. You know, not too much. You know, we don't need like uh, you know aliens or anything like that. Like I said, and uh, I, I shy away from the time travel. But you know, well, we'll we'll see. We'll see. But uh, that that's about it. That's what I think about this. And um, I'm sorry that uh, Jordan couldn't be here, everyone. Movie guys. Uh, it's just uh, obviously if you didn't notice, just Ryan and I today, just because uh, he had to. Uh, take care of some family business, right? Right. Yeah, his uh, grandfather is currently in the hospital. Um, hoping We are hoping here at the Movie Guys podcast, uh, Movie Guys network of podcasts, that he has a speedy recovery and he comes out on the other side. Well, until then, he'll join us for the next time. But uh, for now, it's Ryan and I for Movie Guys podcast. Um, check us out, everybody, on MovieGuysPodcast.com. And uh, we'll see you then. Good night, everybody.